just give it a second for a few people to jump on the stream. All the neighborhood dogs are jumping on the stream. Hey, welcome James Tropicals, first on. Yeah, I took a major step today. One that I, for no good reason, have just been procrastinating on like crazy. Thank you. Yeah, that, that coconut tree I'm quite proud of. Being of the dwarf variety, I can feel reasonably sure it's not going to tower above everything. And the other cool thing about getting a dwarf style tree is that I always think is that they produce fruit so much more quickly than the larger variety. And I claim the fruit quality is better, but you know, I probably upset some people by saying that. But I found them to be pretty easy to grow, fast growing. Uh, all I have given this tree is bunny manure and worm tea. That's it. It's never had granular fertilizer in my yard or anything. And when it showed up, it had more of a yellowish color to the fronds. But very quickly, this is within the course of, hmm, I'd say roughly four or five months, we've got multiple new fronds and they are a much deeper green, which is always the healthy the healthy sign for me in palm trees, when they start to get yellow leaves, that's, you know, a caloric condition. And we don't want that. So yeah, I'm pretty happy with what I've achieved and I'm leading into the topic of this video, which are the final puzzle pieces of this backyard system. And there are two that I'll identify and maybe you can think of more. But I was just thinking of what's left to do. Now, I radically transformed this yard over the last year. I mean, was influenced by s several people that I encountered. And as a result, I incorporated some very useful, productive, cool plants that anybody could grow in their backyard, even if it's in a pot. And I also totally integrated the animal component into the system via chickens, via bunnies, the bunny manure, the chicken compost. I introduced the, you can see over here, I introduced the composting bins. We'll be talking about those just a little bit. See, I've got two composting bins and I say it all the time, so sorry for being repetitive, but I can't believe how much compost it's possible to fit in those two bins. They just keep compressing and compressing and compressing, which what they're compressing down to are micronutrients in many cases, much more concentrated nutrient delivery, which brings me to the first puzzle piece that is left to fit in. And I just started to fit it in, which is micronutrients, really ensuring that I give micronutrients to the, to the yard and to the plants. Now I've been reading about micronutrient delivery and they all, it really is compost, which is the, in my opinion, the best way to deliver those micronutrients. However, composting takes a good amount of time. I wouldn't say it's complicated, but you know, to make really good compost, you would have to have certain ingredients, which I have. But if you can't wait for the compost, et cetera, can't, don't have access to produce it or whatever, uh, certainly there are other natural ways that you can produce the micronutrients. And one is through using biochar. And biochar, simply you know, burning wood, taking the ashes and you know, through either a process or not, getting them applied to your plants. And that is actually the method I am going to use, I decided, experiment with, 
to deal with the last remaining waste components in my yard, which the only thing I'm really putting out to the curb for waste output of this whole household and yard is branches, just the large branches. And so that's really a wasted resource in my way of looking at it, to let that energy, that resource leave the yard when I could just recycle it right back in and use it to fuel other things in the yard is a waste. So what do I do to get cut that last piece out? And so I've been manually dealing with these branches and I've been trying to reuse the larger pieces. You can see I do things like, you see that edge? That's made out of mango branch, larger mango branches, same there. And that, that's just purely for utility to show my yard service, uh, you know, please don't weed whack at the base of these things. But it serves a very important function. And, you know, if I had, and I still might, but it was a good temporary, at least, solution to edge these fruit trees with larger mango branches, as opposed to going and buying concrete edging which was my other alternative, which I still may do in some applications, but I really wasn't wanting to rush in and do that with you know, all the new trees I planted this year. I really planted a lot of new trees and you can see several of them here, but there's the fig, uh, three varieties of figs, new figs I planted this year, uh, three new varieties of citrus I planted this year. The three figs are Janeri, White Marcel's, trying to think of the third, Oh, it's not coming to me, the third type, but it's the really, it's a really, Celeste fig. So those are the three new figs. And then the three new citrus are the Valencia orange you see right here in the center of the shot. There's a lime tree. It's a little hard to see up there in the base of that papaya and banana grove in the shot. And then I also got a grapefruit tree, which surprisingly, to my surprise, has been the kind of struggling one out of the three in comparison, because I expected the grapefruit tree to grow like a absolute weed, which they typically do, but that one's a little bit struggled and I don't know what it is exactly. I gave that one the third uh, method of micronutrients release I wanted to talk about, which is what I did tonight. I went around and actually did a video, uh, created a video with Jack and I going around the yard and applying these this granular micronutrients I got and bought, that was recommended to me by one of the small farms. I got to know and so i applied this stuff it's a granular fertilizer and it's got all the micronutrients and it's supposed to be good for about six months it's like large grain micronutrient fertilizer and i sprinkled that around all of the fruit trees back here so now they all have been turboed with the micronutrients and i expect them to really start to pop a few things in the yard i think look like they might be struggling for nutrients a bit and you know, once you've given it the bunny manure, you can be pretty confident that you've delivered all the macronutrients to it because that is a really good quality manure. And it's also a cold manure, meaning you can apply it directly to the plants on like cow manure, horse manure, etc., which is hot manure that burn the plants. But I always mention these things in these videos. If you're a subscriber, I know you've probably heard me say them a lot of times, but just so that people are aware of kind of some of the basics that would get you because you can kill a plant with uh, manure. You could kill a plant with bunny manure too, I think. Too much of it, for sure. Too much nutrients, and I think you could kill it with too much micronutrients, although I don't know much about that. But I did read some papers on the internet about agricultural papers, studies that various state agricultural departments had done on micronutrient deficiency and its effect on crop yields, crop production, plant health. Production though was the, the focus and they looked at a number of staple crops to include, include corn, uh, beets, like wheat. There was all kinds of things they looked at. Okay, potatoes. And their conclusion in some of these papers that I thought were interesting was that you may or may not have a micronutrient deficiency in, in your crops, let's say, or in your yard. There are ways to test, and testing involves actually, in a lot of cases, analyzing the plants themselves. So, like, some of these studies would take, like, 
you know, 50 plants, the material of 50 plants. And anyway, so the point of the papers that I liked was to say, you may or may not have the deficiency, yet you should probably ensure you are, have micronutrients being delivered to your plants because it's just a good practice. It's just good for the health of the plant. So I know this is a missing puzzle piece and I'm so stoked tonight to sit down on this lawn chair and enjoy the fruits of my labor. You know, I look out of, over this yard and it's been just 20 years of painting life onto it and it's been so fun to do. This was nothing but a grass field when I moved back here. And it's not really that big of a backyard. It, it looks a little bigger in these shots just because these plants frame it in a way that it's like that. But we are utilizing this small space in a hyper productive way at this point. And what really turned the corner for the production and everything in this yard was the focus on permaculture principles and reaching out and learning from other people around here and their farming techniques and then incorporating those ones into my yard always on uh, with the eye on resisting the urge to put in a complex system to solve a problem, simplify, and close off the waste output of the yard and make it all return. So to really use all the systems in the yard to get to some organic content in the soil. And without me doing this, this, this area here is just like the sandy beach uh, that we dig our toes into. This soil is almost all sand. So everything that's organic in it needs to be added in. And plus it's, it's also a very buggy, very, yeah, buggy place. So a lot of the, th the stuff that hits the soil just gets munched up by all the critters and stuff. And it just a very, every, the, the cycle, the speed of life here seems to be uh, rather quick. Yeah. Um, and even how long it takes to compost things. But one of the keys to adding that organic micronutrients back in everywhere that isn't adding granular fertilizer. Like I, I can't, I could add compost around all these trees. And it's probably a good idea, but we like to toss the football back here and the yard guy comes back here. And so I don't, I like the yard, you know, I like to have the grass and we're not using any fertilizers on this grass other than bunny manure. This is pure bunny manure green. And granted, it's not like a golf course, right? But it's great for running around on with bare feet. There's the chickens sure love to eat it. So do the rabbits when they come out here. And it's a, it's a happy balance between really fully committing to the, you know, the jungle effect, which, you know, jungle effect's nice, but you can't really see a snake you're about to step on and you can't really throw the football in the jungle, let's say. Like, so there's certain things. So I, I like to have a nice balance. And for me, that's this, but it's also rather eclectic that I don't sweat the details too much. Like you can see the use of recycled materials in the back or recycled edging and walls over, over time that I built and deconstructed and moved. And, you know, to me, it it's all got a deep history in it. Like these little pieces of concrete right there, the white ones, the rippled ones have been moved like five times by me into different configurations and they just form a barrier in one version of an area of my yard. but. Yeah, the micronutrients application to the things which are, are in the beds is happening now through compost. And I'll show you just a quick look uh, into the chicken free range area. Hey, Hyper Fox, long time no see. Yeah, the, co the coconut continues to grow. Look at these bananas. Can you believe it? Oh, we got some bananas setting up. There you go. Looking good, even some papaya. Yeah, I, might not, I don't know if you can see that, but. Oh yeah, those are the tasty ones. I'm gonna pop those into the, into the good old dehydrator, which has been working overtime lately, dehydrating apples and pineapples and even cantaloupe, worm farm in full swing, plenty of healthy red wigglers, but 
just to show you an example, I recently trimmed the sea grape tree that I've tree formed over here. I'll show you that. It's gotten rather large. Um, this is a giant tree formed sea grape. Look at the size of that. It's pretty hefty. You know, grew that from a seed. Almost everything I have that isn't a mango tree or whatever is grown from a seed or a cutting. But it does tend to want to overgrow and grow into power lines, which is a problem. So I have to keep it trimmed back. And when I trim it back, it usually just produces a bumper crop. You can see I do pretty well keeping that stuff trimmed back now. I vowed to never allow it to get close to those power lines again. But um, it produces tons of these like dinner plate sized leaves. And you can see I took the time to pluck those leaves off and chuck them back in. Oh, look, the chicken's got some leftovers in that. Yeah, it's super fast grower, Hyperfox. So I throw these leaves back there. They actually will dry up pretty fast. The chickens will scratch at them, turn them into compost, and they'll continue to just be re-ingested by this now incredibly fertile, rich area. And look at all these all this leaf matter. That's just all mango leaves and just about everything that I can't fit in the compost bin goes right back in here and the chickens actually move it around. They'll move this and migrate it out into the all areas of this as they scratch and peck. And uh, Underneath all these leaves, these leaves create an incredible ecosystem for bugs. So there are so many bugs back in there, you wouldn't believe it. And they scratch, 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 peck, 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 constantly eating bugs which contain a ton of calcium, which fuel their egg production. I have three chickens now producing eggs. Three out of the five is the two Rhode Island red hybrids. And uh, out of three chickens, I got three eggs this morning. I got three eggs yesterday morning. And I got three eggs the day before. So if my chicken math, I don't like to do chicken math in public, but if my chicken math is accurate, that's five eggs a day once these two barred rocks start and their eggs are even bigger. So we're about to engage in a level five 2021 egg NATO and I'm glad you're along for the ride. If you're not already subscribed, I would urge you to subscribe and also to hit the like thumbs up thing. If you like this kind of content, you can see these chicky doos are well cared for. They are spoiled chickens. There's just no doubt about it. Look at that. Eating leftovers. You know what a chicken says? I poop breakfast. All right. Let's see if there's any more. I always like to do the old, the old check. Doesn't this croton look cool? Check out this contrast of colors. I love doing stuff like this. All right, the Song of India, Dracaena. Beautiful variegated Dracaena. Uh-oh, chicken. With a really kind of unique croton that changes these beautiful purple red colors in the shade. With the tricolor Dracaena growing out through the middle. Look at this, the Dracaena flowers are just incredible. Something out of a science fiction movie. The, uh oh. Well, gee whiz. And I've tree formed some other dressing, as you can see here, that I've actually used for poles to hold chicken fence. Yeah, I love it. And I never get tired of the croton flowers. Look at that. It's unreal. It's why I must always have Dracaena in my life. Look at these pigeon peas. The pigeon peas are replacing the natural shade area I had all over this area with the banana grove that I moved. And uh, they are getting big. And I mean getting big. The width of the trunk is probably like four pencil 
diameters. It's getting I'm getting burly, and this uh, mulberry tree is doing its thing. I've been augmenting the soil here with a little bit of compost as well. Let's see the chicky doos. Maybe we'll let out a chicky do. One chicky out of chicky prison. All right, let's go. Top hen, Ponzi, just one. One chicken we can manage with one hand. Hey, Ponzi, you wanna go out and go for a walk? Yeah, here are some of the branches from that sea grape that I removed all the leaves from. One thing I could do with these branches is make a chicken roost out of it. Oh, wow. Holy moly. One of the... One of... Wow. <laughs> Hold on, girls. It's not worth fighting over. You ought to get some get some free range time. Looks like you're getting tense. Why don't you go out there and spread your wings? Yeah, you're, you're being awfully mean, aren't you? Why aren't you being mean? You don't have to be like that. Yeah. Well, these are the three hens that are laying eggs, and, and I. Might be going out on a limb here to say they're a little bit hormonal. I've never seen them do that before. I mean, he really like bit onto the back of the neck of, of that other bird. I think he, wow, freaked out the bird because wow. Hmm. Well, maybe hey, maybe it is worth fighting over. How do I know? I mean, you know, so sometimes the pecking order's got to change, and the way the pecking order changes is. Bike beats, by, tongue twister, beak bites to the back of the neck. I could say that three times fast. All right, here you go. But yeah, I, I, told, I wonder if I got it in the video. These sweet little Rhode Island reds just, I think it was Blondie actually, this, this darker red one in the middle here. I think she was the, she's the perpetrator. The hen that got, the hen that got pecked, it got bitten, is just, just emerging now. Oh, humiliated. Did you just get knocked down? Let's see. Already getting in a submissive pose, yeah. Oh, man. You okay, buddy? Well, no, but don't go back in there. Oh, no. Ooh, ooh. Boy, that chicken moved in like it was going to assert itself. Isn't it amazing how watching chicken behavior can be so strangely satisfying? And it just occurs to me as I watch my little chickens run around and do what chickens do. People have been watching chickens do this for a long time. This is a much more normal thing to do than watch TV. Although maybe watching TV is just a way to simulate watching chickens. You ever think of that? Or livestock? We spend all of our time watching the chickens, watching the horses, watching all the animals get along and then like applying some transcendental philosophy as a result of discovering the transcendent truths that chickens teach you. I've noticed that if they do get a little, a little scruffy, they get a little salty with each other, that letting them outside to spread their wings seems to help soothe the savage beast. We're about to buy some chicken signs. That was a new thing to me, that such a thing exists. But uh, I guess chicken coops, and building chickens and backyard chickens and the concept of the chicken lady, that's another big one theme out there. 
is uh, a big thing. And so they sell these aluminum signs, but we're going to get a Beware of Velociraptor sign because these are like little Velociraptors, little dinosaurs. That's the idea. Well, I'm glad to see everybody getting along. You know, and it's interesting because these Rhode Island Reds are a slightly smaller bird. They call them bantams, some people do. Um, they're on the bigger side of a small chicken. But that can be a concern, a big concern with getting larger chickens as far as what I've read. And um, because a chicken behavior has a lot to do with size. Bunnies and chickens eat the same things. Yeah, well, Hyperfox, that is true. However, the chickens will eat literally anything, and but the bunnies won't eat meat. The chickens are carnivores. I've seen them attack a lizard and eat it. They know how to do the whole thing, the whole process. Down the hatch it goes. Yeah, in, uh, when I lived on a farm, the, the common practice was to feed the barn mice to the chickens. You know, feed the dead barn mice because you'd always have a trap out because you always have mice and rats and stuff on farms because of all the feed everywhere. So you're always trapping the rodents and feeding them to the chickens or the hogs. We didn't have hogs, but we had goats. And now you can see that this system really didn't work that well. You know, I had this three foot fence and well, the problem was missed a little spot, missed and just I don't know, maybe it's trying to tell me, you really don't need to have this fence here, but in a way it's kind of nice to, when they come out here to have a novel little area to explore. They love going back there and finding a new bug, the unscratched bug areas as a special treat. This is a nice evening activity, as weird as this sounds, we do this sometimes where we just let them out and just let them into this little area to free range before it gets dark. Which they seem to love. And the more organic material I put back here, the less it seems like there is back here. I mean, it just the yard, by them scratching it and composting it all the time, it just eats it up. It just quickly transitions it into a really usable medium. Now we could go take a look at the bunnies. I am way overdue for cleaning their manure collection system. Yeah, and you don't have to tell these chickens twice to go back in the coop. Oops, I left the door open. No. You stay back in there. I mean, not a bad life, honestly. Is Thumper running? Thumper is running. Thumper's out. Thumper is already out. We have a free range rabbit. Now, this is not a bad lifestyle. Thumper cam. interesting fun fact about bunnies is that they can sleep with their eyes open. If you ever thought about what it might be like to have eyes on opposing sides of your head? Yeah, ha good question, Hyperfox. Has, have the chickens attacked them before? Um, the chickens have pecked at the bunnies. So, depending on whether you call that an attack, it was nothing like what Blondie just did to Ponzi back there in the 
nothing like brutal like that, but they just pe they gently pecked and a couple times they fluffed up and kind of charged at the bunnies, which made me concerned because I'd be worried those chickens can get, they know what to do if they need to. And like, they can get pretty, pretty vicious, I would think. I saw what they did to that lizard. So I would worry about these bunnies getting pecked in the eye. All right, we don't want you getting pecked in the eye. You can't take that. Oh, if I scratch you, you're just gonna go to sleep on that rock? You're already asleep. So relaxing to pet a bunny. And believe it or not, this incredible, cute little male lion head bunny just produces pan after pan full of the highest quality manure you can imagine. It's pretty incredible. The color on this bunny, I, I believe, are second to none. I don't think a bunny really could get much more cute than this, perhaps. It can be different, but wow. And since we've just been picking them up and letting them hop around and dig holes their whole life, they're very chill rabbits. <laughs> yeah. Now, unfortunately, we can't have Thumper and Penelope in the cage at the same time. Or we would have baby bunnies in 30 days. How's it going, Penelope? How you doing, sweetie? How you doing, sweetie? Just chilling? She's been down for plenty of exercise time today. I think I'll get her some mulberry sticks though. They love a good mulberry leaf. Look at the size of this Persian mulberry that I grew in here. <laughs> it's, a, it's a nuts. And if you notice that color of green, that incredible healthiness. Yeah, she could probably smell those mulberry leaves. Yeah, you wouldn't mind if I got you some fresh mulberry leaves, would you? I'll cut you some before, before I go in. Yeah, and really, they were, they had told me that the Persian mulberry was the finest fruit. Persian, the Persian mulberry fruit is the finest mulberry fruit there is out of all the varieties. And I was skeptical, and then I tried it, and yeah, it's so much better than the Everbearing, even though I still love the ever, Everbearing. But this is, you know, I mean, you could directly attribute the health of this to, of course, the same thing as everything else in my yard. The bunny manure. This one getting extra amounts of bunny manure. And the worm tea. But uh, you can see, yeah, a pretty full bunny turd collection. That's way overdue. But, you know, to be honest, it doesn't really draw in money flies at all. And, uh... It doesn't smell, so not really. I mean, very little, almost none. So it's not, it's easy to kind of neglect it, but also it just, it stays kind of dry under there and dries up into these dried pellets that you then just sprinkle around all your trees. Well, we do have some late season figs. Now, here's an interesting thing, a new change in my yard as well, is that we got late season figs. Now, we really like that, because we love figs. But I've never seen the fig tree load up on figs again at the end of the year like this, because we get this rust on the leaves, which you can see some of it on this leaf, this black dot thing, and you can treat it or whatever, but the point is, I don't. And uh, so I think that's, and it always has tried to fruit again at the end of the year, but that like all the fruit falls off. But this year it actually leafed and fruited. So I do believe we're gonna get a second crop. I mean, look at this. Some really nice fruit. I am rather pleased with the outcome of this bunny run. And I've been trimming back from this bench, by the way, which I designed myself, very simple design. Uh, I designed it to 
not be easy for bugs to set up nests. That's why I put all this thick wood on the bottom, but very simple design. Just a, you know, two four by fours on either end, two by four across the top, then two by fours along the bottom, and the one by sixes. All the pressure treated wood, so it'll last for a good long time. Hurricane's probably not gonna pull it up out of the ground. Super stoked on this on this red sugar cane. Look at this. This is lemongrass that we're going around on the outside here, but middle. Look at that waxy, beautiful color of that red sugar cane. Is that something else? You can see these sugar cane. I love that sound. Sugar cane itself produces a great chop and drop situation. And I think we had an escaped, I think. Maybe we had an escaped chicken. Well, Thumper, I'll let you spend a little bit more quiet time out on the rock. And a free range chicken. Let's count chickens. I count five chickens. What are we doing? I like this <clears throat> this diameter cage for the adult chickens, the bigger chickens. They can get their head through without getting stuck and get what's on the other side, so I think that makes them less nervous. Oh, look at you. Are you going to eat that mole? Oh, you great old chicken. Destroy that. Hey, 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 hey. This is why we don't want you here. All right, I think it's time to go back in the cage, girls. Come on. Come on. Come on. See how gentle these birds are? It's like incredible for chickens to be that tame, in my opinion, but I don't know. Chicken's gonna get in here? Hmm. I might have to get out the chicken mover. This isn't very effective because they aren't really afraid of the rake. Maybe just move the rake like this. Let's see, they don't, they're not even afraid of it. Gently touch them with it. They'll just start to move. What I don't want to do is get them into a thing where they get af afraid of it, like terrified. This is like being chicken bow peep. All right, well, that one outsmarted me. This one. Come on. Come on, chicken. Oh, you did not. And then there are four. All right. <laughs> yeah, I know. You're wondering if you're welcome back in there after getting knocked off the pecking order like that. And chicken bow peep. My life has come to this. One handed chicken grab. Gotcha. Bam. What, what a sound. Ooh, once again, did you see the one go after? Wow, a 
tell you what, this might be, I mean, it's not crazy to think that this could be Rhode Island Red Revolt. This could be, you know, a whole change in the pecking order, which we've shown. Because those barred rocks, although they're bigger, maybe they're just capable of, not capable of maintaining their position in the pecking order. Oh, these spoiled birds, they have water down below and they have water up top, but they only have food up top. And as a matter of fact, this is a good time to, to kind of with me on my evening chores, as they say. Yeah, do you think they're horrified at night? Yeah, they just kind of make cooing sound. They don't seem too afraid. There's really not any predators here or anything to scare them. We don't really have any barking dogs or anything. So I think they just fall asleep, mostly. All right. And I always inspect because I want to be real good about not letting any chip manure stuff build up. As you can see, we got a little concentration of the manure right in here and some in there. I may just grab a scoop and scoop that out. I put in enough so that as I scoop out places where they've been, did you hear that? Hmm. Scoop out places where they have used the bedding to poo. That way they don't step on it because I want their feet to be as clean as possible when they go back into what is now a meg, whoa. chicken out. I don't know what that's all about. Although, you know, I almost feel like I shouldn't interfere in chicken affairs. <laughs> Who am I <laughs> to get involved in chicken affairs? As a matter of fact, you know what? You chickens figure it out. I get enough problems. All right. Seems like chicken should be able to solve chicken problems in my book. And if if it gets a little pecky, let's say, well. Foxes are a huge threat to backyard chickens. Yeah, absolutely. That's probably one of the worst things you could have for backyard chickens. I think there's even cartoons about it. Look at this. My chickens have laid golf balls and I'm stoked because you know, I, it also helps me with golf. But the real reason you see golf balls in there is that that encourages all the hens to lay their eggs in there. Well, you know, what can we say? Those, it's like the David Bowie song. Those chickens are going through changes. And, you know, every once in a while, well, it's just going to get pecked back into the corner of the cage. I mean, I am amazed at how they know to bite right on the back of the neck like that. It looked like it really hurt that chicken. Hmm. Probably just hurt its pride. <laughs> how you doing back here? How you doing? Totally humiliated, are you? Chicken depression. Yeah, no, not just the roosters are aggressive. I, and I think the rooster probably regulates the aggression of all those hens to some extent. <laughs> that if you want you take a rooster out of the equation, like you are the rooster. And you know what the funny thing is, man, when I go and come up on these chickens now, they automatically get down in that rooster mounting position in that subservient hen. So that means they absolutely think we're roosters. But they do that for just about anybody who comes up on them quickly. But, uh, yeah. The dadle, the dadle hot pepper is 
doing quite well. I'm going to start getting into growing hot peppers, and I decided to do that in Florida this time of year. I'm going to have to grow them in the shade. It's a small hot pepper, but yet it's the beginning of a, an era. I bought some more of these fiberglass steaks. I love these things. You can get them at stores. <laughs> fiberglass steak. You just pound in the ground, so I got that holding up the moringa. I've got one, a smaller one here, holding up the roselle. You can see the roselle is really going off. Beautiful. Even had some flowers on it today that might have dropped off. But this back corner is doing really well. Keeping up on the watering. Now I've been planting just a lot of what I've had in this grow table. Hey Dolores. And adding new stuff. So starting to move the mango the sprout out of the compost bin into some pots. Plan is here is to grow a bunch of rootstock, mango trees, and then graft on branches from the good mango trees in my yard. Tamarind. The, actually, the robolinis are growing quite well. Those are robolinis. Robolini palms, dwarf date palms. And what I do is I grow them in a pot like this, and then I separate them. Brassicas. I'm not sure what those are, but I'll have to look them up. Yeah, I'm always looking to plant new things, especially things that produce a lot. I've been growing a lot of cuttings of things like that, like this mulberry. You can see even this cutting's got fruit on it. And just a ton of moringa. Look at all this moringa. And star fruit. Growing some basil too. Fall is really a great time to be planting things. So stoked on this mango tree. This is the new mango tree. Spent 40 bucks on it. Why not? Malacca mango. So the attractive thing with this is that it's 10 feet tall. And they say only eight feet wide, which will fit right where I put it. But 10 feet tall is the right, the right size for this end of my yard where I want the sun to be able to, this is south end, I want the sun to be able to keep going through to the rest of my yard. So perfect. But the other thing is that I, when I did a little research on this one, they do say it's productive, disease resistant, you know, kind of hardy mango tree. So it's known to be super hardy. And that reminded me a lot of the Tommy Atkins mango tree, which to me is a incredible champion among mango trees. I, it outproduces everything in my yard. That's the Tommy Atkins mango, this one here. This is the Hayden. This one is the Edward, the weakest. And now we've got one right next to it to put it to full shame, the Malika. And I think I may get at least one more mango tree here to fill in the collection. Especially since now I have a way to process the mangoes by drying them. I figured all that out, the drying fruit thing. So I'll be able to, you know, process large quantities of them. Plus I'm going to set up more uh, trade scenarios where I can trade buckets of mangoes for things I want or need around the yard, which is a really cool thing. I got to do a little last year, going to do a lot more this year. Now this soursop, unlike the one I planted in the shade, really got wobbly. So I used one of those fiberglass stakes to uh, sure this one up hammered down in the ground about two feet deep but without that i mean it was really like it had not grown much leaf structure at all um, if you watch the channel you know i'm doing a bit of an experiment where i planted two and i like to do this in all cases growing new trees plant them in multiple location get multiple trees give it multiple chances and that usually pays off for me um, recent example pigeon peas new thing for me Planted 16 peas, 16 peas sprouted, planted them all over every area of my yard. Some places they died, like here, for whatever reason. I think it's too dry, probably, just too dry. But in other places they thrived. Places I thought they wouldn't thrive, they thrived. And places I thought they would thrive, they died. So, but through doing that, I was able to exercise one of the permaculture principles of observe and interact. So. That taught me how to grow pigeon peas a little bit more than I knew before that. But I give myself a lot of chances to fail. And uh, so I planted a soursop there in full sun. 
full sprinkler blast and I planted this one in no sprinkler blast. And the reason the sprinkler blast thing is worth noting is that the sprinkler systems here that come out of wells contain a tremendous amount of salt. So if it gets on the leaves, you know, this happens. This is from, I'm sure, sprinkler getting on it, but it, it'll kill part of the leaves. But most, some trees will just grow right through, but some of it aren't, don't grow fast enough and just die as a result. So it's always kind of like, let's see. And by planting them in different places where they get more or less sprinkler on their leaves, they grow, you know, usually really well once they get not, you know, once they're not in that, that zone of getting salt spray on their leaves. That's what really gets them on the leaves, not on the trunk. Uh, the thing is though, these trees only have about up to here to grow before they're gonna get sheared off by the salty nonstop flow of Eastern wind that we get here. There are some months that it doesn't stop blowing to 15 to 20 mile an hour East winds, totally encrusting everything with salt, which is why you see this gigantic Dracaena hedge I've grown along here. Now this is a chocolate pudding tree, but along the whole Eastern edge of my yard, I grew a, I utilized this edge space to be a barrier for salt and it's proven to be highly effective. I mean, if you look around it, you know, in yards and in, in where I live, this is a unusual yard to have and it's because it's very arid and it's also very salt blasted. So the things that tend to survive without the salt mitigation are things like, you know, palm trees, et cetera, which typically do better in those scenarios, or at least can grow through it. So yeah, big, big move up today. The puzzle pieces are fitting together. So I actually spent the whole video talking about the first puzzle piece that I've started to fit in, which is the micronutrients piece. And then the second puzzle piece that I've got to get uh, f finished fitting in is my water catchment, my water retention capability. Uh, I do have a small uh, potential now. Oh, thank you. So yes, I love the chocolate pudding tree. It's looking great. And by the way, easily distracted. Look at the look at the size of these fruit, man. Isn't that beautiful? And there are a bunch here. That's just the low hanging fruit. But the water catchment system. Now I've been. This is going to be my bio of my biochar area to further expand my sustainable micronutrients production. And who doesn't want to have an old rusty stall just laying on the river rock? But this, which is a dual purpose, a dual purpose water catcher from the edge of this roof where the most water runs off. And and I'm also using this to catch it, which is our, my new little uh, wheelbarrow hauler thing, which has been really useful. Oh, Thumper, Thumper, don't want to forget about you. You don't want to spend the night out on the grass, do you? bunnies are fed and put to bed. The chickens were restless, but I believe they've cooped themselves. One of the miracles of life. No, they have not. Only one. Yeah, you know, maybe we'll go in there and get them to coop themselves just so I can shut the door. And this is really the ultimate protection for the chickens. which is the latched door. So no predator, even if they get past this, can eat these sweet little chickens. Not so sweet if they're competing for dominance, but come on, chicky chick, come on, chicky chick. Oops, there's one. 
That's the smart chicken. Come on. Chicken bread. Go on. No. All right, just like that. Life on the beachside farm continues. It's that easy. Chickens. One of the best things I've done. That'll be even more evident as I eat some of those eggs tomorrow morning for breakfast, which have been incredibly good. All right, thanks for watching Eat Your Backyard. I appreciate you being with me for this beautiful Florida evening. I hope you will incorporate this stuff into your life. And I hope you have a great day. Thanks for watching Eat Your Backyard.